Hi, I'm Jamie Hitchings, of Filmmaker U, filling in for Gordon Burke now. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen the diversity of their skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or follow us on Instagram at filmmaker underscore you. Every week we interview a film professional and this week we are joined by Richard Rakowski, whose works include Masters of the Air, The Americans, and Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you for being here. Thanks for asking me. I really appreciate it. I'm going to dive right in. And, and I had the opportunity to uh, view Masters of the Air recently. And um, I'm just going to start with Masters of the Air, if you don't mind. I don't mind. So <clears throat> you were the cinematographer on part seven and part eight. And yeah. I'm going to not give away too much, but I want to ask you something in particular about part seven. So there's some aircraft that land at the base, uh, March 6, 1944. It was an extremely dramatic scene. And can you talk a little bit about the choices what, that went into covering it as you did? Yeah. Um, my director for my block was Dee Reese. And Dee uh, has done lots of beautiful work. I got to meet her on the show Mudbound. And specifically on Mudbound, which was shot by Rachel Morrison, I was involved in recreating the aerial war over Europe. The characters are at war over Europe in aircraft. And so I think it was a natural segue for Dee to think of me for this job. Dee had a very specific vision for the catastrophic damage done to bodies and psyche in this form of warfare, in, in the form of warfare where you're trapped in the very vessel that keeps you from falling to your death, but its frailties and its, its ubiquity in the air mean you're the target and you come back very damaged. And she was very specific, she does her homework, and she wanted to show the, the multitudes of different damages that the human body suffered, but also the human mind. And that's in the script and well depicted that these were, um, men, young men, mostly, all volunteers, who knew the dangers and continued to go up. And sometimes they came back in pieces. And that's what we wanted to show. It was a, an extremely impactful, impactful scene. And it also uh, ends with a, a, an overhead shot, a sort of twisting, rising overhead shot, which has a metaphoric significance. And I hope that people that watch Seven will appreciate the, the work that went into it. It was um, it was a difficult sequence to completely film. It required a couple days scheduling around different things. It was a difficult sequence to watch, not in a bad way, but it was it, it really took me out of my comfort zone when I was screening it. It was fantastic. I've been a camera person for 30 years and I fell in love with cinema. I heard there was free film school in France and I wanted to get into the French film school. I really didn't know anything at the time, but I knew at least how to take pictures. So I said, I'll try for the image department. And then when I miraculously <laughs> got into the French film school, I fell in love with working with the camera. You're following what's going to be in the movie. So that immediacy that the camera allows is what I loved from the beginning. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and this is my course about documentary cinematography. One of the things that really drew me in was your use of of shadow and um <clears throat> you used a lot of this was supposed to look like it was natural light but there was a where there was a lot of use of shadow to make the story like very visually congruent can you talk about your choices with the work with natural light and shadow well <laughs> as a as an overall topic natural light is the light you aim for. And of course you're embellishing it or recreating it, or in some cases shaping it to, to serve dramatic purposes. But I believe that the, the basis of people's visual understanding 
comes from our heritage as as uh, you know non non modern day peoples when we understood that daylight was daylight and firelight was firelight and the way to have light at night was to build a fire and daytime announced itself and shaped your day and your schedule and uh, I think you're referring to the work in the POW camps which is gloomy shadowy dismal because they're they're in a different place. We we introduced this location to the overall storyline, Dee and I did. And the existence in the camps is really hard, really difficult. Again, young men, 19 up to 26, confined and under threat of whatever is going to happen to themselves and their captors in these miserable conditions. The uh, Luftwaffe ran the camps, which was slightly better than the SS running the camps, but they were still under, under a great deal of deprivation, even to the point of the light bulbs being the dimmest light bulbs that the Third Reich could produce. And if they went out, sometimes they just didn't get replaced. And so we took in a lot of homework that Dee had done and a lot of information that had been recorded, thankfully, by flyers and, and written about and drawn. And we tried to render that. Sometimes the drawings of one of the red red tails, uh, one of the Tuskegee Airmen, Alexander Jefferson, did drawings in his barracks and in the camp, and we would recreate those items or sometimes even the frame he had drawn. And I felt a lot of obligation to history. So rather than making it too bright or too charming an existence, it needed to look like what it was, which was um, being a prisoner. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, part eight, and um, specifically, there was a there was a <clears throat> stamp that said it was June third, nineteen forty four. It was leading up to D Day, and Crosby, one of the characters, needs to be awake for three days, and this was definitely treated in a very specific, it had a very specific visual treatment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, Crosby is the lead navigator and has uh, advanced from being in the cockpit to at the headquarters, and he's laying out the routing for literally thousands of aircraft on dozens of missions. And the Air Force had to suppress completely the Luftwaffe's ability to get into the air and attack the invaders on D-Day. D-Day had to be free of the threat of air attack for it to succeed. And there's lots of plot points threaded through the um, threaded through the season that discuss how the Eighth Air Force was instrumental in keeping this uh, goal alive, which is suppressing all air attack against the Allied invaders. Crosby decides because uh, he's committed because he. He values the lives of the many works with because he feels as a navigator himself that he can do the best job, that he will just keep doing the missions day and night for three days. Having had some college experience of all-nighters, and in fact, I have at one point been up three nights in a row. Let's not ask all the details there, but I was up three nights. Your mind loses touch with reality. Your, your feet leave the ground. You, you begin to confuse a dream state and reality. So we wanted to get into that, and we used a few different uh, methods, one of which was a, a sort of flattening and a flashing of light in order to say, one too many speed pills here, buddy. Another was spinning around him in a rig that Pat Garrett, our key grip, who's marvelous, helped us create. In this uh, rig, you could spin around the head of the person walking through the space and you could travel with them. So it's not just sliding on an eye rail, it's also in articulated motion controlled by a rheostatted motor. So you can speed it up and slow it down, initiate it and stop it. And it's a lot of work, but the goal was to say, this is a person who's losing his uh, his center. He's losing his inertia. He's becoming completely uh, gone to the sense of sleeplessness and sleep deprivation. And I think it I think it was effective. I mean, it's a lot of work, but I think it was effective. The actor coordinated with us in this. Mm -hmm. These planning was very exquisite. 
There was a sense of traveling through space around the headquarters, long takes that, that are in and out of doorways and finding. And then there was that sort of creepy minutia of like the ticking watch, like the ticking watch suddenly fills his senses. And this is all very accurate to sleep deprivation. Um, I enjoyed working with that actor very much. And I think the, the results are on screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a it was a great scene. I really enjoyed it. And and I obviously you're not the uh, sound designer, but it was very, very well mm -hmm. engineered as far as the sound goes. Yes. So <clears throat> I'm interested about the the onset virtual production that that was used. Can you can you just talk or walk us through that a little bit if you're able? Well, at the very beginning, uh, the first directing and filming team had the concept to work in a volume and a large volume, one of the largest. And Adam Arkapa, the initial director of photography who really helped set the look and the sort of passionate accuracy of the production and, and its interpretation, its sort of poetic interpretation on camera, had this really great scheme where you would surround sections of the aircraft with walls that had the content that that in theory you would see if you were flying. Then it had a huge overhead uh, roof also programmed for video. All of this coordinated sophisticated in a very sophisticated manner to where the lenses were applied to the airframes or on an arm near the airframe. Then on top of that, a sort of sunlight an alpha, I think it was a 10K alpha light on an arm, itself operated by a person on wheels who could point the light into the cockpit windows and move the light, they're all on headsets, to represent an aircraft turning or climbing or descending. This was a complex uh, creation, but what it did is it allowed you to see reflections in all the windows, and these windows are at multiple angles, and in the case of the nose cone of the B-17, it's really a convex mirror, like just in, in an incredibly challenging thing to, to realize for photography. So we not only had these, these sort of horseshoe shaped screens all around and a full roof, we also had sections we could bring in underneath so that we could apply video imagery to a large rolling section of video screen. And that way we could fully cover the reflection capabilities, but we also were using that as our light I mean, between the alpha light in motion as, as harder daylight, and then this incredible bathing of light, you really got to approximating what it's like to be in an aircraft at high altitude with the reflections of light off the clouds. And what was equally and importantly um, helpful to me was I could tell the operators of the screens, okay, in this section, let's dial it down, let's make it darker or let's even take the imagery away and replace it with a grayed out blob. Whereas in this section, again, something not seen on camera, you can track a very bright shape moving so mm -hmm. that I can get some form of like brightening, darkening interactivity. Because if you're in an aircraft and you're moving through cloudy landscapes, you have subtle variations in how much light's hitting the face. And it's a very contrasty environment. The aircraft has no real light in it that equals outdoors. But with that many windows, you have this obligation to feel the light from all around. Mm -hmm. And I've done, obviously, you know, aircraft and car and train interiors before more traditionally. This provided the most incredible realism in terms of how the light felt on the faces, how it fell off as it entered the cockpit and it would get darker in the background. And uh, essentially, it gave the performer the opportunity to track with their eyes things that were part of the sequence they were performing in, hugely beneficial. Everybody can see the same enemy aircraft approaching or can look to the same point in the screen and see their uh, comrade in an aircraft that's turning over and exploding and falling. Hugely helpful. It can take a long time to get those things coordinated outside of this system. So I was, I was incredibly impressed by it. It sounds really fascinating. I could talk to you about this for... Forever. It, it sounds forever. Well, it took forever. You know, it takes a long time to coordinate that much uh, data across that many screens with that much accuracy. And it didn't always per perform perfectly. Sometimes we'd hit hiccups and they would have to stop. What Adam had learned to do, Adam and then Jack had learned to do, 
is to load up the cockpit with cameras, use the Rialto mode of the Sony Venice 2, stick them into positions that captured a specific angle on two men or one man or just the hands and run them all together so that you could just run through a sequence, cue it back up to the beginning, run through it again. And sometimes we'd even see the other camera a little bit, but we'd trust that VFX was gonna paint out that part and that the overall image was going to um, you know, be, be respected and be the guide for the sequence. Now, what I noticed is that in, in part eight, we have um, a cockpit scene with the Tuskegee Airmen. And, and I really noticed, and you, you kind of mentioned it before, I noticed their eye line. It was much more dramatic. I felt like I was, as I was watching it, I went back and I watched it a few times, actually. I felt like I was really, I was there with them. And I, it, and it had a lot, and I was going to ask you, but you kind of explained it. It had a lot to do with where they were looking and they felt like they were actually immersed in the, in the plane. It was fantastic. Well, start by crediting the cast in D and then backwards one up to crediting the page. The page was written dramatically and the page had a lot to offer in terms of introducing these particular flyers. It's, it's now a, a, a well-known fact that Tuskegee Airmen were the most lethal pilots in the air in terms of their accuracy. They were, they were uh, much, much praised and justifiably so for the number of kills that they uh, initiated in missions. And their effectiveness overall was very high within the Army Air Force. Um, the, sometimes we had the screens around the Tuskegee pilots. Sometimes we had different types of screens, smaller screens that we rolled in. We didn't have the full volume all the time. And we only had partial cockpits, unlike the B-17s where they built enormous big sections of the aircraft. With the Tuskegee's, we built sections of a P-40 and then we built, built a section of the P-51 cockpit. Now it was a very good section and beautifully made. And I, I can't credit the British uh, uh, artisans enough who created these cockpit interiors. And even that, you know, 180 degree plexiglass canopy that sits there and it rolled back like the real thing. So th these were incredible creations. The, the men were uh, very into it. I was very into it. <laughs> I'm a flyer myself. And I think that just the spirit of it uh, lent to uh, excellent value in the, in the sequences. Also, credit where credit is due, the visual effects supervisor and the visual effects creation, which took a couple of years, really brought that, uh, those things home because we had only filmed small pieces of the cockpit. You had to then take the whole plane and set it against other planes or set it against a skyscape or a landscape. And that was pretty incredible. We had filmed P-51s air to air. We had been in a French turboprop and we'd filmed from an underwing camera the P-51s in, in different lights, morning light, front light, back light. And that became a guide for the creation of CGI aircraft. And they did a very good job with that. You're, you're a flyer yourself. Seems like you were the right person for the job then to, to get into I was that. I was blessed. I was blessed. Between the history, which I'm a history nut, between the qualities in the book, Donald Miller's book is incredible. And it documents these pilots and, and uh, these... Uh, these characters are in his book as real people. So that was quite moving and many other persons and many other missions, but the book was incredible. Then to be involved in things with vintage aircraft was just completely up my alley and a total joy. Um, I really, I, I learned something, but I also feel like I was helpful when it came to talking to the individual performers and talking to Dee about this is what a pilot does. This is how a pilot orients themselves. This is the behavior in a cockpit. You know, it's not, it's, it, it's kind of like when you have scenes where people are driving cars or race cars and they're always wrenching themselves around and being very dramatic with their body language. A pilot only wrenches themselves when something's going completely wrong. Otherwise, even in critical climbing, twisting, it's controlled. It's, 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 Full observe, observation, only sometimes coming back to the instruments, and then it's situational awareness. Know your horizon, know how close you are to other aircraft, know your speed. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a full sensory input returned with skill, not with... <laughs> so I have one more question for you. 
And we ask everybody that comes on the the Filmmaker You uh, broadcast, what is your guilty pleasure go-to movie or television show? Um, what's something that you will always watch or come back to or kind of have on the background? Um, well, I'll preface this with each mood can generate a different a different answer. If depending on the mood I might be in or something I'm trying to escape from perhaps, it'll generate a different answer. But I do have an answer to this because I am asked it a lot. And the answer also involves a little bit of a cop out because I have a black and white and a color. And the black and white guilty pleasure, like if it comes on for even 14 seconds, I'm gonna watch the whole thing is Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, brilliantly photographed by Gilbert Taylor. And really what people don't see when they watch Dr. Strangelove is how much his background as a photojournalist and kind of a documentary cameraman came into play. A lot of the scenes inside the B-52 are handheld, airy 2C. You know, it's, it's, it's less of a controlled film than people like to think of it as. Everybody thinks of the big Ken Adams set where it's like, you can't fight in the war room, but really there's a lot of handheld work and there's a lot of uh, putting yourself subjectively in the position of the B-52 crew that shamefully do not get the information that they have to go back and not bomb Russia. That's one of them. The second one is a strange little Brian De Palma movie called Phantom of the Paradise. So Brian De Palma in his early career had three in a row that were just amazing. One is called Sisters. The next one was Phantom of the Paradise. And the third one was Carrie. And he made these three films essentially in a row. And Phantom of the Paradise involves Paul Williams playing Mephistopheles. And it's kind of a crossover of Faust and Phantom of the Opera. And it's an absolute delight. Absolutely wonderful. Um, Garrett Graham is in it. He plays a character called Beef. William Finley plays the Phantom. And Jessica Harper, the amazing Jessica Harper, plays the, the Phoenix. And it is so uh, kind of over the top that I can't get enough of it. I'm going to have to see that. I don't, I don't think it's even on my radar. Thank you so Paul, much. Paul Williams' music is unbelievable and his performance is unbelievable. Um, Garrett Graham at one point is accosted by the guy who runs the show at the, at the paradise, this place they're going to open as this ultimate rock palace. And he's been seeing the phantom haunting the place. So he's trying to escape. He's coming down the stairs and the guy Philbin tries to stop him. And he goes, dude, can't you feel the vibes in your own house? bad sport, real bad. And then the guy says, come on, that's you. That's you because you're taking drugs. He goes, I know drug real from real, real. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I'm going to have to, I wrote, I just wrote it down as you were talking. Yeah. I'm going to have to check it out. But, Thank in, you so but much. somewhat like, somewhat like other directors who hit a, a kind of like amazing stride, like the, um, the, the fact that he did Sisters, then Phantom, then Carrie. And in fact, Phantom, was production designed by Jack Fisk, who was married to a very young Sissy Spacek. And it was by seeing Sissy Spacek dressing sets on Phantom of the Paradise that De Palma cast her in Carrie. Huh. De Palma's such a student of film too. I, I'd like to see that and see what he's referencing in there as well. That's that's really interesting. Thank you so much. I usually I usually know what what uh people are gonna or not what they're gonna say, but I usually know the titles that they're going to speak about. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and you gave us so much information and it was wonderful talking to you, Richard. Yeah, it was wonderful talking to you and I really hope people enjoy Masters and especially uh, Block 3 and Dee's work. Uh, it, was, um, it was one of the most inspiring projects I've ever been a part of. It was it was beautiful. I, I went into watching Masters um, and in your episodes, knowing that you did a lot of the Americans, which I, I am personally a big, big fan of the cinematography of the Americans. And it's a it's a completely different visual look and, and a different pace and everything else. And I was just I was blown away. So I was expecting 
I was expecting something else. And then I got this, this beautiful, this beautiful um, <clears throat> cinematography that you and your team created. It's fantastic. Oh, thanks. You know, I'd also done another World War II period show called Manhattan, which was about the Manhattan Project. Beautifully done show, written beautifully, directed beautifully, acted beautifully. In fact, I'm currently working with one of the directors from Manhattan, a woman named Julianne Robinson. And that had some elements that we brought forward into the work in um, in uh, Masters of the Air. It's it's period World War II at Los Alamos, which was very specific, but the need for authenticity, the need to not dishonor the truth of these real events by creating too much fiction crossed over very well into the work on Masters of the Air. And I, I really wanna acknowledge Playtone, Tom Hanks' company, Gary Getzman, his producer, uh, Kirk Sandusky, and John Orloff with keeping a huge amount of attention to the absolute accuracy of what the men witness, handle, sleep in, eat in. It's all researched and beautifully done. Production designer Chris Seegers deserves a huge shout out. Yeah, the production design was was amazing. I, I... I'm not a student of history as you are, but it felt very, very real. It was epic. Thank you so much. And that's You're it welcome. for this week. You can check us out at filmmakeru.com or follow us on Instagram at filmmakeru. I'm Jamie Hitchings. And thank you so much, Richard. And thank you for watching. I appreciate your time. <laughs>